name is Stephanie Schrader. I'm Curator of Drawings at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. You know him from his grand portraits of Dutch merchants. Um, usually men who are wearing these large rough collars, women who are soberly dressed wearing um, similar types of ornamentation, jewelry often. They're usually very sober. Um, they are not particularly ostentatious, but they're grand and individualized, so you always get a sense of them as people. Um, he was very interested in showing um, someone's sort of, not just their exterior, appearance but their interior soul and I say that in so far as that he made many many self portraits of himself and different expressions showing how he looked laughing how he looked angry how he looked bored so he was very um, interested in capturing someone's unique sense of personality I became interested in this in this particular subject Rembrandt and the Mughal line um, in 1996 I was a graduate intern working at the Getty and I had the ability to go through a box of Rembrandt drawings. And I was very familiar with some of his subjects. I mean, everyone knows he went out and portrayed the Dutch countryside. Um, everyone knows that Rembrandt was um, an incredible storyteller, that he loved to show people in human interaction. But I had no idea when I came across these two figures um, with, dressed in this very different, into my mind, exotic manner, um, I had no idea who they were. And I looked it up, you know, to see the title of the drawing, and it said Shah Jahan and Dara Shiko. Again, I had no idea who Shah Jahan and Dara Shiko were. And I thought, this doesn't look like a typical Rembrandt costume, right? It's not showing a Dutch rough and, a, you know, sober costume clothing. So I began this exploration of who were these who are these people? How? Why do they mean something to Rembrandt? How did he even come in contact with who they were, and how he, how could he even be informed about this Mughal Empire? So that's you know the mystery, right? The question that everybody wants to know. Um, we know the Dutch were trading in India. They had a trading post in Surat, the Dutch East India Company and they were bringing art back and forth. They were sending art and also bringing art back. And they were trading with the Mughals, the rulers um, of the northern part of India, and they established these rich trade relations that made them, they both benefited from. They also, in, as part of that negotiation, brought art. And that's how we believe these paintings got into the hands of Rembrandt through that trade relationship. Now some people will say that he owned them, we don't know that for sure, they're not listed in his inventory as such, but we know that many of the merchants in his circle, people he made portraits of, people that were his neighbors, people that lived, you know, close by, they owned Mughal paintings, they owned collections from all parts of Asia, and we think that's how he came into contact with them. So we have 23 that we know of, so we've been able to find 23 of these drawings. That's not to say they're not more out there. They haven't been discovered. As you know, drawings are small. They can be kept in someone's collection and never known. One of the drawings that we're borrowing for the exhibition was in a French private collection and has never been seen by the public before. So there could be more out there, but as to date, they're 23 in number. made eight portraits of Shah Jahan, he made several portraits of Jahangir, he made a portrait of, Ak I'm sorry, one of Akbar, one of Aurangzeb, so, and other courtiers and princes of the Mughal court, but it seemed that the person who fascinated him the most was Shah Jahan, and he shows him both with his son Dar Shiko on his own, on horseback, two different occasions, as a young man, as an old man, so sort of all stages of his life, which you would think would be interesting for Rembrandt because he's interested in portraiture and trying to understand how one portrays themselves, how one shows their identity, who they are, and in the case of the Mughals, their magnificence, their wealth, their real um, divine right with the aureole around. He shows all aspects of that type of 
understanding of who they were. You know, Rembrandt would use a quill that was sharpened, or he would use a um, reed that was sharpened, and he would use a brush, but he never would use the fine type of brush that Mughal artists used. I mean, it's reportedly that they used a brush of one squirrel hair, for example. That's not something that Rembrandt had, I mean, you know, in his repertoire. Um, and even the etching needle, which could create these fine lines, it wasn't something that would even occur to him to sort of imitate, I don't think. It was so beyond his artistic world that, and he didn't have the tools to recreate it. I mean, he had the paper, maybe, that had that element of, um, refinement and finish, but he didn't have the brushes. Could these really be by Rembrandt? They're so different than how he draws. They're so detailed and they're so um, refined. Did he really make drawings like this? So that has led um, some to question if they're by Rembrandt and if they are by a pupil art Kelder. So if you show Rembrandt drawings to a Mughal expert, they look at them and they say, oh, they're so messy. They don't look anything like a Mughal painting to me. But if you show them to a Rembrandt scholars or to people who are familiar with Dutch art, you say, oh my gosh, they're so finished, they're so detailed, they're so meticulous, they're so refined. They're so detailed in the way that he shows you every single aspect of the egret feather, of the sash. So to my mind, as a scholar of Dutch art, they're very finished and very detailed. But to other people's mind, it'll look very different and very more spontaneous and loose. But if you compare them to other Rembrandt drawings, you will see that they really stand out for their finish. Rembrandt didn't even sign his drawing, so we want all these documents saying what he felt about the Mughal Empire, why he made these drawings. We don't even, you know, he didn't even sign his drawing, so that kind of documentation, we don't, it doesn't exist. So a lot of what we say when it comes to Rembrandt is based on what we can see with our eyes and how we place him in relationship to other artists at the time. So um, why he made them, why he needed to make 23 of them, is I think he's making them as a series, so not just one. If you want to copy, figure out Mughal costume, you can do it in one or two drawings, right? You don't need to do 23 of them. He's very talented, he doesn't need to make that many, so I think he conceived of them as a series, and he was hoping to perhaps sell them, they were on expensive paper, and make some money at this time. In addition to artistic evidence that Rembrandt copied these drawings and thought they were important enough to make 23 of them, we also know that other artists were interested in Mughal art, and we know that there was a poem written by one of his contemporaries praising Mughal art above and beyond all European art. And that is really saying something. I mean, it's one thing, it's hyperbole, sure, but it's one thing to say that it's great, it's wondrous, it's beautiful, which it does say. It's another thing to say that it makes all European artists quiet, basically. They can't speak. They're so struck with awe at this incredible type of style and majesty and um, color and beautiful details and details that they couldn't even imagine how you could even paint that they bow down basically to the Mughal art. But if you think of the Dutch as a global, you know, republic trying to define who they were through their importing and exporting of objects, then I think the Mughal works fit in his, his work completely. It just shows his international cosmopolitan side. It shows him living in a city that was very diverse and it shows the Dutch and as how they want to be remembered as the you know one of the most important trading um, nations and a very important artistic center. <laughs>